So welcome everybody, so nice to see everybody. Glad to see a nice turnout. Um, I appreciate the invitation from Laura. I had been sort of thinking about this. I wanted to kind of put something together because I realized as I thought about it, um, all the things that my father has built over the years um, for the town of Saugus, but also just starting back when he was a teenager, he was drawn to woodworking. Um, I always tell the story of how he um, remodeled his future in-law's kitchen when he was in high school. Um, my mother, um, he did my grandparents' kitchen. So he started out early. A lot of it was self-taught, but I'll talk a little bit about where he trained as well. Um, and I got a lot, it's, this is mostly pictures of things that either he made for the town or made otherwise, but I um, wanted to give a little background as well. Whoops. I know, handsome, right? I know. That's why he and my mother fell in love when they were 15. Um, all the girls were after him. I still hear those stories. Um, but that's his high school graduation picture. And I love this saying particularly um, because I really do feel like he was an artist. You know, we think of artists as painters, sculptors, musicians, you know, whatever. And they have a body of work, but um, I think tradesmen, quote unquote, have a body of work as well. And a lot of this to me is very artistic. Um, and it's, it's a humongous, when I was first starting to do this and I was taking pictures and I, it just, I kept taking pictures and more pictures and I'd find something. I was still finding things after I put this together that aren't on this slideshow because I just kept finding them and it was like, well, you can only take so many pictures. They're not gonna sit there for three hours. So, um, so I, yeah, <laughs> well, the way I talk, you might. Um, so, and this is just a little, again, I, I, I should preface this by saying that I've made up a, a booklet of this, and my intention was to have a booklet for everybody that came tonight. Um, I won't bore you with the details, but technology nowadays is not what it used to be, um, and it's much more complicated than I thought. I used to teach on the college level. I did PowerPoint presentations all the time. It was no big deal. Um, this was a much bigger deal. So my apologies for not having a, a booklet here, but I do intend to put together some booklets and I'll have more information about that, about where um, they might be available and that sort of thing. Um, not, not for sale, just for um, uh, your own memories. Um, but I, so the reason I put in some of this was that I wanted to, for anybody who might be picking it up and might not know him or the, the history of the backstory, I just put in some wordy stuff to give a little <coughs> bit of background about him. Um, and this again, you can, I'm not going to read this, but I, I thought it was really important to mention this company, um, Joseph Gertie company, furniture company. Um, where he actually did his formal training. So when he got out of high school, he went to Boston Trade School, and um, which doesn't exist anymore, but he's obviously specialized in woodworking, carpentry, furniture making. And that's really where he learned all the really intense skills that he brought to everything that he built. Um, and Gertie was the leading company in the US at that time in what was known as either custom furniture, fine furniture, you know, made to order furniture, however you want to word it. Um, but it was um, custom pieces that were ordered by people that had um, a lot of resources. Um, and they could order exactly what they wanted, what kind of cabinet, what kind of wood, the size of it, and it was all custom made by hand by the artisans at his comp at Joseph Gertie's company. So my father, when he was in Boston Trade School, he actually got to apprentice at the Gertie company. And then um, he was hired after he finished the trade school um, experience. And he made a lot of a lot of these early pieces I'm gonna show you, he made a lot was part of making them for customers, but also for the family. And so we're lucky to have a lot of these really beautiful Gertie made while at Gertie, but made by him. And he had um, access to these unbelievably beautiful woods and um, uh, detailing and craftsmanship that he learned when he was there. And he, he told some stories about how you know, the, the people there, some of them did only carving, for example, or some of them did only finishing or whatever it happened to be. So um, people were very skilled and he learned really from all of them. And that's where he 
got his very high standards for how he did things, which the people in the senior citizen class, I think, know that he didn't, he wouldn't settle for cutting corners or it has to be done, you know, this way. If you want it to look nice, this is how you have to do it. And he always used to say that. Well, if you want it to look nice, this is what, how you have to do it. It's, you got to take time to do it. And sometimes it would be days, you know, he'd, he'd do one thing and then he'd say, well, I have to let the glue dry or I have to, you know, whatever. And he'd come back the next day or the next week or whatever to finish the project. But he did it to these exacting standards. So that's the reason I bring up Gertie because it really um, influenced everything he did from there on out. He learned from the best of the best. So um, I'm going to come back to this, but you probably have all seen this sign that used to be at the front of the high school Pierce Memorial Drive. Um, I think it was from about 1990 to 2020 when the pandemic hit. And then, as you all know, they um, tore down the old school and put up a new school. But this was all hand carved, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. And I also, um, you probably a lot of you know that he built a house in uh, West Newfield, Maine, on a lake, Balch Lake. So I've interspersed a few lake pictures just because you don't want to listen to me talk all the time. So um, I put in some uh, pictures of the, the house in Maine and the lake as well. Um, Okay, so just again to quickly recap, you know he started as a teacher in, in 1956. He, he got after, when he was um, at Gertie, um, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending how you look at it, he got drafted. Um, he was very proud to serve in the Army, and he served from 50 to 52. Um, and when he got out, he was torn as to what he was going to do because he loved the woodwork. I mean, he knew that was it for him. That was his life's work. But what do you do with it? He consider going into business. He had had some business on the side with a friend of his where they did kitchens, redid kitchens and um, all of that. And he was always building furniture for somebody. Um, but he was sort of talked into it by the family to utilize the GI Bill and go to college. And so he got his degree in industrial arts at Fitchburg State. Um, and uh, just a little word too about industrial arts education because you probably all are aware of the discussions that are going on now about um, uh, you know the utility of industrial arts education and it was too bad we got away from it and all that and I completely agree with that I'm sure a lot of you do um, but industrial arts as an area of study in the public schools came about um, a little bit it started in the late 1800s when people were moving away from farms and into the city and there was more industrialization and when when people grew up on farms they knew uh, how to do so many things you had to you were the only ones you could rely on so not only did you farm but you had to know carpentry and and um, how to fix a, a wagon wheel or uh, you know build a well or whatever it happened to be on the farm and then people were losing those skills as things became more industrial and people moved more towards cities. So the whole idea of teaching industrial arts in the public schools came about. Um, and I have a, a book here. I, um, at the end, I'll pass these around, or if people just want to browse the books. But um, there were a ton of books on industrial arts topics um, in the house, in his house. Um, and you know, as those of you who knew him know, they, they were kind of all over the place. But um, um, I found dozens of them really and I just couldn't bear to let them go. A lot of them I think are quite historical. Um, I even called the Brattle Bookstore in Boston because I wanted to see if that you know some people have niche interests in what they want in books. Some people want books on art or, or farming or whatever. Um, so I haven't followed up on that yet. I haven't had time but um, they are interested in at least seeing what I have. Um, but this one, this is called A History of Manual and Industrial Education 1870 to 1917 and it was published in the, I think it was the early 30s, um, it was published. All of these books here, most of them were published either in the 20s or 30s. Um, some of them are textbooks from when he was teaching industrial arts in the high school. Um, so some of them are, are more like the 40s and 50s. Um, but they're really fascinating to look at if you have an interest in any of it. Um, the drawings, the, 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 um, the topics they cover. There's one book on constructing furniture, and it talks about finish, and it will talk about finishing maple, finishing walnut, finishing mahogany, you know, all these different, like, 
tips for on the different kinds of woods. I don't know if you could even find anything like that anymore. So um, I found that just myself personally kind of fascinating, but I love books and I love history. So, um, and then I found some old pictures. I just wanted to show you some old pictures. He was the, um, the advisor to the audiovisual club. He was a, a jack of all trades. He really could do everything. Um, so he, whenever there was a function at the high school, in those days they did they recorded it and you know they had to make sure the sound and the mics were okay so um he um oversaw that he they had a booth in that auditorium and he used to be up there during all the functions um this is from his office in the 1980s i found so many great pictures that i didn't even know existed but um i figured out this was from the 80s does anybody know why i figured out this was the 80s Big hair. <laughs> so um, I'm just assuming it was the 80s. That's going to come back someday, I know. Um, and then these are just some random pictures from graduations, proms. Those I'm not even sure what years they were. Um, his retirement dinner. Um, I really like this picture. Unfortunately, that's my Uncle Ralph, his brother Ralph. And unfortunately, his eyes are closed in this picture. Sorry, Uncle Ralph. but. Um, but I like this picture because it was, it's just a happy picture. Everyone's laughing. And I, he said something funny, obviously. So I really like that picture. Whoever took the pictures at his retirement dinner was fabulous. I don't know if did anybody here do that. I, I don't even know who took them. Um, but we have a whole album of them. They're just great. Um, some of you may remember Clayton Treffery. Um, he was a well-respected gentleman in Saugus, selectman, and various other things. And he obviously, he, he and my father really, you know, liked each other. And he obviously said something that made my father laugh, so I like that picture. And that's just me after I gave my little spiel. I like a picture of me hugging him. Um, when he retired, do you, I don't know if you remember Bob Sacco. Um, he used to do a lot of illustrations for the advertiser, you know, any kind of occasion or sports game or whatever it happened to be. Um, this is kind of funny. He, he, he has like the deer talking down on that um, bottom right corner and they're saying, oh, don't worry about him. He never gets any deer. You know, he never bags anything. And, um, um, and then he did teach himself to play the accordion. My father did. He, he, I don't know what he couldn't do. But, um, and he said something about, you know, he's serenading. He has a, he has a happy audience or something. They're probably all howling. <laughs> My mother was a big, you know, was a very, very talented musician. And I can remember him sitting in the front room with the accordion and she'd be in the kitchen and he'd hit a wrong note and she'd scream, C, C. <laughs> I don't know why it was always C, but it was C. Um, this was election night. So he ran, he, he taught in, in Saugus until 1993. He ran for school committee that year, and that's when he retired from the high school. Um, and he ran again in 95, and these pictures are from the election night in 95. He, um, he got the most votes that night, so he was elected chairman. And I, I look at this picture, and he, he looks kind of like worried or unhappy or something. He had a good night. Um, he, and somebody took a picture of the TV where they um, kept a scroll of the vote totals, um, but that was the night he was elected for the second term. Um, okay, so let's start with the structures and the things that he made for the town of Saugus, and I just listed things on the this page, and then I'll go through them. So this is one of my favorite pieces, the Selectman's Desk. You've probably all seen it. Um, it's just, uh, you know, it's just a striking piece. But the reason that I talked about Gertie as much as I did, because he put design elements in a lot of his things that he carried through his whole life. A lot of these little things that you would see him doing on and things he probably taught you in the class were, were little flourishes that um, he learned at Gertie. And he always used to say, well, let's just do this, dress it up a little bit. That was always his saying, right? Dress it up a little. Um, so this desk was made in three sections so it could be pulled apart and moved around. And I tried to get some good pictures of close up. I have a, I brought a laser pointer because I was going to try to point out some of the things, but I, I don't think it works on the LCD screen too well. So um, you can see, uh, I'll just try to describe it as opposed to pointing to it. 
But um, you can see the finials that are up here on the little posts. Um, you can see the, the moldings, the raised panel doors, the vertical lines here, and the vertical grooves that he used to carve out of pieces. Um, and this scalloped edge and what I call the little punched in circle, that's what I call it. But you, you guys will recognize, I'm sure, if you've seen it, his pieces or took the class, that these were all things that he's learned really well at Gertie. If you go on to, um, if you go on the internet and you look up Gertie, there are pictures of furniture that's for sale currently. Um, you can't find out that much about Gertie actually on the internet, at least I haven't yet, but um, there are auction houses that have Gertie pieces that are being auctioned off um, from, I'm sure, beautiful homes. Um, and they look so much, um, I'll show you some of the pieces that he made while he was at Gertie, and they just look so much like things he made. So he learned those design elements there, and he kind of carried them through his whole life. Um, this is just a closer up detail. I like the way he made the sort of sloping. That's just a little extra flourish, as he would say, to dress it up. It wasn't anything particularly functional, but um, everything was elaborate, and he didn't believe his one of his favorite sayings too was he'd always say oh I just slapped it together if he was talking about something that wasn't that great to him that was just slapping it together if he put you know two sides and a top and a bottom um, this wasn't slapping it together he always put some design elements into it um, that he learned and again the scalloping the pushed in circles um, the moldings the carving the the raised panels etc and a lot of the items do have plaques on them, um, which is nice. I think there's a couple that maybe don't, and I was going to um, have a couple plaques made up to put on the ones that don't. This is the podium that he uses for, um, uh, that they use at the town hall as a speaker's podium at selectmen's meetings. Um, and he, he was proud of this one because he made it so that it would be um, handicapped accessible. If you can see, it's sort of, um, it starts narrow at the front and then it widens out at the back so a wheelchair or somebody who need, maybe needs to sit um, can sit there. And you can see the, the elements, again, the flag was one of his signature things that he put on a lot of things. That was all hand carved and then hand painted, the flag, um, the vertical lines, the elaborate molding here. You can see it's not just a straight across piece of, of wood that, you know, is on the bottom. He, the, the moldings, the, um, this is more 3D, this kind of stands out. Um, the carving, I, I particularly like the panel here. Um, the dowel moldings, the grooves, et cetera. So again, a lot of the same things. The, the picture on the right, there's a shelf, so if you have notes or something like that that um, you want to um, read at the meeting, it, it slides out and you can put notes on there and things like that. Um, and this is just a closer up look of that panel, the flag, the carving, and then the one on the right is just the side view. You can see again the, the nice molding and the handle that he put on the side of it. That can be wheeled around. Um, if you've been in the town hall at all, and probably all of you or most of you have been, um, the curio cabinets he made. I tried to put dates in for things that I knew. I wasn't sure about this, but this, the, these are one of the earlier ones that he did for the town. Um, but again, putting so much care into it, and I don't want to belabor the point, but just look at the detail again, the moldings, the um, vertical grooving, the scalloped um, where the glass is, the scalloped shape of the wood, the very um, elaborate um, moldings here, the raised panel, um, everything he did, it was, it was um, again, not slapped together. So there were two of them. So when you first walk in, one on the left, one on the right, and that holds a lot of the town memorabilia, historical things, that sort of thing. Um, and this just, again, I tried to get some detail, some close-ups of the detail on the pieces. Um, the molding on the top of that, I think, is particularly beautiful. I love the scalloping where the glass meets the wood. And there's a plaque on that. So this is the one, Donna will recognize this. So the garden club came to him and asked if he could do a coat rack for the town hall that the, that the garden club would donate. He donated all of his time when he made all these things. He didn't um, take anything for the time. Um, people who wanted something done, they would 
supply the materials and he would donate the labor. So I always have to laugh because I think you can't just go to my father and say, could you please make a coat rack? Because a coat rack you think of as a pole with hooks <laughs> on it. This was his idea of a coat rack. So nothing simple, not slapped together, obviously. Um, a lot of the same design elements. It's, I think it's one of the prettiest things that he did. Um, so again, I tried to show the detail. The hook, you can see all the hooks for the coats, but um, the, see the fan-shaped carving right above here? Um, that's something that was typical of Gertie pieces of furniture. So he, he learned to do that at Gertie's. Um, the, uh, um, the, the, the molding across the top has little square pieces that are actually glued on to the piece of wood, so there's a 3D effect. Um, and again, the doweling. Um, and I just, again, wanted to show the, the punched in circles, the molding, the finials on the right-hand corner. You can see the 3D effect of those pieces up at the top. Um, he made you know, made it look like panels here. So he put a lot of, <coughs> excuse me, time and effort into it. This is on the arms, but the vertical lines and the, I, I always call it the punched out holes. I, I'm sure there's a technical word for it, but, um, and the close up of the, the fan. So, um, and this was, this is the plaque that's on it. And this is a little article that came out at the time that it was donated by the garden club. And there's Donna. Um, he also made uh, the cabinet for the conference room in the town hall. Um, and I, actually, let me go to the next. The, the conference room was redecorated and, and reconfigured to reflect more of Saugus' history. So this little, I know you can't read that. My, as I say, my intention was to have a booklet, but um, it, it describes, this is a little blurb from the Globe. It describes, you know, how it was refigured and what was put into it and all of that. But um, it just mentions that he, he made this cabinet. But again, the 3D effect, the front of it protruding out, the two sides, re, the two ends recessed. Um, and I really, I like the back where it kind of steps up and steps up. Um, again, with the elaborate molding. Okay. He also did, you know, he's a very proud veteran and um, loves veterans, loves his country. So you, he made that case for the World War I honor roll out in front of the town hall. Everybody goes by that every time they go in. It's not a great picture, but it's the only one I could find at the time that it was actually put up. Um, Unfortunately, the finish is wearing off due to weather things, and um, he uh, he could have fixed that, but he, he couldn't towards the end. So, um, but it's still um, a beautiful, beautiful piece. With again the vertical lines, the car flag, the finials. I like the way he did the angles here on the the wood at the bottom. Just so something that's a little different. The elaborate moldings. Um, all of that it's just it's just a, to me it's a gorgeous piece and then this is a veterans park you probably know but it's at uh, the corner of central street and winter street um there's some monuments there and then you could purchase a brick back in the day and um, probably still can in honor of a veteran so there was a groundbreaking back in 2013 and the shovel that was used, they asked him to build a cabinet for the shovel. So that's housed in the library. And the funny story there is, I, I, as I said earlier um, to some of you, I, I didn't necessarily know everything he had made. I knew he had made certain things for the library. But that um, I, I just didn't really remember. And when you go up, so I went to the library to take pictures of the things he had made. And when you go up the stairs, I'll show you this CD cabinets right there that I'll show you that he made. But I was talking to the library director and I s somehow I, s I said something about I wasn't sure everything he had made. And I said, I said, because over there and it, on the far wall um, to the right, it's actually the front wall of the library where the computers are. I said, you know, because that looks like something he might have made. And I didn't know. And as I got closer, I was like, I know he made this. And I didn't even see the plaque. But again, it was this, the, the, 
designs, the finials, the Gertie furniture. There's some, um, if you go online and look at Gertie, um, that top, the, the way that top is done with the, the peak and then the, you know, th that was signature Gertie. Um, there are pictures of pieces of furniture, beautiful pieces of furniture that are for sale now um, at auction that have that exact same um, configuration on the top. He, he used a lot of gold pen. Um, he, um, he used the, the elaborate moldings, the finials. Um, and again, there's the American flag. Um, so I want to spend a little bit on the sign because I think the sign was just unbelievably gorgeous. It was all hand carved, um, you know, huge. He built the roof for it and also the base for it. Um, he used different woods and also different color stains. He could, um, he was able to match stains too, like if he was fixing a, fixing a piece of furniture and it already was stained but it had some you know, missing pots or he had to put another leg on it or another rung on it or something. He could match the color of the stain to that piece of furniture so that, because a lot of people say, oh, you know, I have to throw it away, the, the arm's broken or the rung's broken or how will I ever make it look like it hasn't been fixed? And he was able to do that. So he was very good with stains and with colors. He had so many cans of paint and so much stain I can't even begin to tell you. I cannot even. But he knew where everything was. He knew where everything was. He could find it in a second. And you'd, you'd go in there and you'd be horrified at what you saw. And he, he could find it. So this is, again, a close-up. And I just wanted to point out all of this, the wording and all this is so <coughs> hand-carved. So where it says Saugus High School, Home of the Station, that was carved out of the piece of wood that he was working on. Those weren't letters that he you know, glued on. Um, the feathers, the headdress is incredibly ornate. I love the carving on the headdress, uh, the headband. Um, the feathers, as I say, um, where it says welcome, that's all hand carved. He used the symbols again of the flag and then the books and the light of knowledge sitting on top of the books, um, clouds, mountains. And this was a gift um, from the classes of 86 and 89. They had asked him to make some, a sign for the school and they funded it and he made it. He spent, you know, obviously months on this and um, it's just a gorgeous piece. And I, I think that um, this shows it really well. This is a work in progress, obviously. I was so thrilled to find this picture. But see how you can see how 3D it is and how it you can definitely tell that it was carved as opposed to glued on or anything. But that was all done by hand. And then he used the different stain colors for the feathers and the clouds and the mountains and all that. It's just, um, to me, it's an unbelievable piece. And, um, you know, again, when we talk about artists, you know, to me, this falls in that kind of category. And it's something that is, it, it, to me, it's a, it's a, it's a legacy item, uh, you know, a, w along with a lot of the things that he made. Um, not something to just um, discard. It's in my backyard. <laughs> under a top. Yeah. So I'm, I'm working on that. I'd like to find a, a good home for that. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Um, so, you know, we'll see, but I, I do think it, it needs to find a, a permanent place. And there, there are lots of thoughts about it. So working on it, but I'm not getting rid of it or tossing it or anything like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's safe with me. Um, okay, and then the schools, he made some signs, you've probably all seen these driving around, and this one kind of cracks me up because it, it, those of you that knew him well, he hated painting wood. You don't paint wood, you stain wood. You don't put paint on that beautiful wood, but somehow this one ended up painted, I'm not really sure how, but um, what I like about this one is, that's why I wish I had the laser pointer. But this strip along here at the bottom, you can't really see it, but I'll show you close-ups. But he carved into it um, the words reading, writing, arithmetic. Can, does that show up? Yeah. 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 So that long strip, those words are carved in there. And 
I think they would definitely show up better if it were stained, right? <laughs> the paint sort of covers it up, so he was right as usual. Um, but this kind of cracks me up too, because where it says arithmetic, he put a little A in front of it. And I swear he was afraid people would think he didn't know how to spell arithmetic or something <laughs> if, if he didn't put the A in there. Um, but this one shows it the way it is um, close up. Yeah. Um, and then he built a sign for the Waybright School too. As you know, both of those schools are closed now. Um, but the, um, I guess must have been the advertiser did a story on it. They called him the Wizard of Woodworking and they, would, they talked about some other things that he did. But as part of it, there was a picture of him with the class. Um, oops, sorry, that's the next slide, sorry. Um, and that's the principal at the time and the teacher of the class at the time, that gentleman with the white shirt and the tie. Um, but you can see again the same kind of elements of the flag and the carving and the vertical lines and okay <laughs> so now we come to his his place his happy place the place he loved the most the shop um, i don't have a lot of pictures of it but fortunately i have some pictures of it um, and it was a place he loved i know all you guys who did the class loved um, lots of lots of good times there. Um, the class, the senior citizen class, started in um, about '96, I think. I'll get to that in a second. Um, but he loved he loved the machinery in the shop. You know, he knew he knew how to use all different kinds of machinery, and this was vintage stuff. I mean, this was there when the school opened. Um, and he loved it. It was heavy. It was well made. It, you know, rarely they rarely broke those those machines. He knew how to use. I don't even know half of them. The lathe, the bandsaw, the you know, table saws, drill presses. I, I don't even know. Um, and uh, he just loved. He loved that equipment. Um, and he 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 flourished when he could be around the equipment doing something. Um, and the place was, as we've said, you know, it was anybody who walked in, it looked like a mess. He knew where everything was. He could find any screw or nail that you needed. He could find any paint that you needed. He could find anything. Um, one of the things he said when the, when the, everything was, you know, lo uh, loaded out of there when they were, um, taking the old school down. And uh, we brought some things home, not, not that equipment and all that, and, but, you know, th materials that he had in the shop, the paints and the stains and all the tools and all that. And he, he said, he said, I don't know where anything is now. <laughs> you know, uh, he just, he, he said, I, I couldn't find it if I had to, you know, he just because it was all disrupted. So this was, this was really one of the happiest times of his life. He taught the senior citizen class for about 26 years. Um, he probably had hundreds of people go through over that time period, but he also had a lot of the regulars that I'm happy to see here tonight. He loved going to that class. And as you all know, it was, um, it was Tuesdays, and you didn't schedule anything for him on a Tuesday, ever. And, you know, I would make a doctor's appointment or something, and I'd tell him, you know, you have to see Dr. So-and-so. It's not a Tuesday, is it? No, Dad. <laughs> it's not a Tuesday. I promise it will never be a Tuesday. Um, and occasionally, somebody would, like, schedule him and make an error. And um, I didn't even tell, uh, you know, they, they would send me the notices, and I, I would, like, i just get on the phone and say, we can't do this. It's Tuesday. Um, some of you here, and I don't know who all did take all these pictures. I know, Car I, I, I don't want to slight anybody because I know people in the class took these pictures, but they put a great uh, piece together for his um, 90th birthday, and they took a lot of pictures. I'm, I'll show you in a second the board they made for him. But you all know he loved his Cadillacs, and he always used to say, if my car is there, I'm there. If my car isn't there, I'm not there. All right, that makes sense. But they had they had captioned it "Commons in the House," and I love that. So I put that. Um, and there were there were many more pictures. I'm going to show you this, but um, he uh, these are just a couple of the ones that 
that you know as people were working on projects and all that sort of thing um, but Carol long brought this in tonight I, I know you can't really probably see it very well and I'll, I'll be happy to pass it around but um, these are some of some of the photos that are on here came from the stuff that um, you all did uh, at that class and at the birthday party so I I had come across this picture which I love yeah I love this picture I mean it was just somebody said something everyone's laughing I, I like the happy pictures um, so everyone was having a great time but I didn't realize there's also one with the guys not to be slighted or anything but the men have a picture too so I didn't have this at this time so what, what I will do because this is a PowerPoint is I can just inject this into the presentation and I'm going to take I can scan these pictures and um, easier said than done but don't get me started on that um, so thank you for bringing this in um, but I'll show you they made him on the next slide they made him this beautiful poster on his 90th this was fabulous it was like what four feet tall three feet tall big poster um, with the, the newspaper article about him but then a lot of ca uh, candids that were taken in the class with all the people in the class some of the things he worked on um, just just fabulous just fabulous all right so let's get into another um, town structure that um, has his work he didn't he did not make this sign someone else made this sign but he did do some painting on it but he didn't make the sign but this is another one of my favorite pieces this tree of giving um, this is all hand carved all wood he did the whole thing um, they did submit a design to him a design idea that they had this idea for this tree of giving and they wanted to you know so he conceptualized it from there everything was done by hand all the leaves were cut out the painting and all of that stuff it's in for those of you who've been in the senior center it's a very narrow hallway where it's on the wall so it's hard to get a picture like back to see the whole thing um, so this is just a different angle and then you can see the close-up some of the leaves um, the, the leaves have the names of people that were um, that either donated or they donated in memory of a, a loved one or a friend, a family member, and there are still some blank leaves on there for um, people in the future who will uh, who give. Um, he carved all the the branches in the tree trunk by hand. This is he put in the little bird and the little berries, you know, to just again dress it up a little. Yeah. Um, and then this is um, at the bottom of the the whole thing it's in the bottom right hand corner and he made it look like uh, a log you know he took hammers and whatever else he did to make it kind of look like this tree was sitting on a log and then sort of painted in some flowers um, I love this piece because this is a book um, that has all the names of the people who were on that tree of giving and so it's called the remembering book remembrance book but I really like this because he he made a book cover but it, it's out of wood you know so he made a, a wooden thing look like um, a book cover and you can see the design details again that he always was you know known for the punched in but I love what how he made it look like a binding um, out of the wood and so then it, it opens up this is how it opens up and um, even the the wood if you can see when you open it up on this the beauty of the two different kinds of woods you can see how the grain comes through that's what always meant a lot to him so that's why he just had this thing about not painting wood this is the table when you walk into the senior center in the lobby um, and it looks you can see the the lathe work on it and it looks a lot like a couple of the kitchen tables we had over the years um, he we had two or three of the kitchen of kitchen tables that are of his um, but I wanted to point out on the right you can see what looks like a crack in the leg that leg is this leg right here and actually what it is is um, and if anyone is here from the senior center they can probably tell me but um, they did a a uh, time capsule back at some point I don't know when and they wanted to put it in they wanted to hide it somewhere so he made the leg so the leg opens up and they put the time capsule in there and then at some point whenever they I don't know when but they'll take the ca time capsule out so it looks like it has a crack in it but actually it has and, and I'm thinking how do you make how do you do that and not have the leg you know had the table fall down or something but he made it work 
Um, this is a beautiful crocheted flag at the Senior Center. You can see the crochet better in the two right-hand pictures. Um, the ladies that are listed there are the ones that crocheted it um, back in the 90s. But he made the frame for it. Again, the kind of elaborate top with the finial and um, the doves he put on it. You know, just things to kind of embellish it. Um, he made the uh, sort of a TV table or an audiovisual table for the Senior Center. Um, this front is like a, a foam kind of material. So their speakers, you can hear the sound through it, but this TV is audio visual. And again, you can see all the same kind of um, uh, design embellishments he used with the vertical lines, the elaborate molding. In this case, he didn't do the groove verticals. He actually had pieces of wood in the shape of those grooves. Um, he made the podium for the senior center. Um, again, you know, not just straight down two sides, straight down, you know, um, the gold, um, trim around it. He always used this octagon shape and if you look at the Gertie pieces that were made at the Gertie company they did a lot of these octagons so that's where he got that um, and just the elaborate moldings and all that. He made a case for the radio that sits up on the wall. Um, Laurie had told me that Laurie Davis at the Senior Center that this was the last thing he had made for them. I don't know when it was but the flagpole, and I just took a couple of close-ups more of the, the detail again, the, the legs, the you know the the piece, the pots that are in gold are kind of carved in. They're sort of uh, recessed a little bit. Um, so he he fancied up anything that he made. Um, even on the outside, he did some sort of plaster work. At the, you did you work on it with him? Yeah, he, it is a plaster of some kind, right? So. Um, it, no, maybe, Oh, okay, the resin. Yeah, well, it was, it's funny because I didn't know, this was one I didn't know anything about, and when I was in there taking pictures, someone said to me, the columns out front, you got to look at the columns, and of course, when I went out there too, there's the little punched in, you know, I keep calling them punched in circles, I don't know what they're called, but I was like, yep, that was him. Yeah. Yeah. He so he paint right. He painted it to match. That's the point he make. Um, he could match colors, and he wanted it to look like the other pillars, right? Yeah. Um, and there's a little there's a little thing here. He had a li that little plaque. He had a little um, burnisher thing that had his name on it that he would burn the name his name onto things. The branding iron. Yep. And that's what. That is, um, it has, it said Carmen Michelle, a handcrafted Saugus Mass, something like that. Um, he was volunteer of the year with Mary Dunlop in 2001, I think it was, at the Senior Center. So that's just a little article about that. Um, this was him doing some painting. Um, the library. So he made the podium for the library. And again, what I like about this is it's got this medallion on it. And he hand carved it. Um, and it's the book, you know, you can see the books and um, the dates of Saugus founding and incorporation. And then at the top, it says Town of Saugus. But again, the little circles. Um, so I, I can identify right away, even if I didn't know he made it. Um, the CD and DVD cabinets. These cabinets, they're it's two separate cabinets if you can see that line so they pull apart and you can move them around so the library has them pushed up back to back um, and uh, the draws but again here's that octagon shape there's always something he puts on it that's sort of a signature thing and he made a few step stools there for us vertically challenged people to get at books um, and you can see that it opens up so you could actually store. I have a few of those in my house. My sister does, it, a lot of people. Um, and he had several in his house and then some in Maine. So there's a lot of those floating around. Um, the fire department, this, this is actually one. Um, so some of you might remember Chief, uh, former Chief Jim Blanchard. He um, was just a fire history buff. And in the old days, they had what they called a fire gong before we had electronics and, you know, uh, alarms on our phones and all of that. 
and that would announce if there was a fire and if you had to call in the volunteers or whatever. And um, so Jim Blanchett had asked him to make a case uh, to make an old, to replicate a fire gong from the old days. It was, it's decorative, it wasn't used to alarm people about a fire. But um, it just, I think it's one of the most beautiful things he made. And I think, I think Jim Blanchard um, has that. He has retired and um, he, he loved it. I mean, he loved, there was an article in the paper, which I'll come back to later, but um, it's just so elaborate. I mean, I don't even have to say anything if you just look at everything. And that top, again, is, is Gertie. It's just, you know, a lot of Gertie pieces had that kind of very fancy top with the finials. Um, you know, the, he uh, just, I mean, just the detail on it. And, you know, he, he made it, installed the, the works. Um, and Jim Blanchard just loved that thing. And then World Series Park, um, he, he actually had approached Bob about it, um, Bob Davis, and, you know, said he'd like to contribute something. And um, they came up with the idea of the trophy case, which is, you know, gorgeous. So this is um, uh, where they keep all their memorabilia and trophies. And this is the same thing, just at different angles. But you can see the shelving that comes out on the end. And he sort of made it asymmetric in some places. Um, and it's just a, a beautiful way to keep track of all the awards and the, the wonderful things that have happened at World Series Park. And um, this is just a little um, uh, thing that was in the paper about when it was dedicated. Um, some of you may know, especially the historical society people, but um, the Roby Elm is a, was a well-known landmark in Saugus, and uh, it stood almost across the street from where we are right now, and there was a plaque embedded in this rock to talk about the history of the Roby Elm. And um, someone, in it, it was made of bronze or whatever it was, and of course a few years ago, many years ago actually now, um, it was stolen for the metal, um, I'm sure. So someone, he, he was asked to replicate it. So he made this, the, the frame is wood. It, it obviously needs, it just needs a little sanding, a little stain, that's all it needs. Um, and, uh, but this is just lettering that he did. It wasn't, it's not carved or anything. Um, it's just lettering he put on there. It's not metal so that it wouldn't get stolen again. Um, but that marks the position of the Roby Elm. Um, the Cliftondale Congregational Church approached him because their front doors were, had seen better days and they're beautiful, gorgeous oak doors. And um, they wanted him to refinish them. So they removed the doors completely. They brought them down to the shop. You know, they were laid out where he could do the finishing. And um, I just wanted to show him. I wish I had a before picture, actually. I don't um, of that. But these are the end product of his refinishing the gorgeous oak doors at the at the Cliftondale Congregational Church. And then people heard about him, you know, you know, he made things for people all over the place. And his stuff is probably in so many, you know, I know he had jobs in Brookline, Marblehead, Swampscott. He, he was always fixing something for somebody or building something or redoing their kitchen or whatever it was. But somebody approached him, um, someone knew about him for, uh, to make a sign for this temple. Um, so he made the sign for the temple in Burlington and you can see he, he this picture is when it was going out the door and then of course that was after when it was installed we took a ride up um, you know when it went once we knew it was installed so I could get a picture of him with the sign but you can see the Star of David's that he decorated it with um, and just again sort of his signature work beautiful sign for that temple all right, and I wanted to, how are we doing with time? Because um, um, I wanted to show you the house in Maine. Yeah. Um, it's 8.03, but you didn't start right at 7. So okay. We okay? Sorry, I talk a lot. Um, so this is the house in Maine. I, I could tell you so many stories, you don't have time, but it was a great experience. He built the whole thing from the foundation up, everything. Foundation, plumbing, electrical, woodwork, you know, tile, everything. He did, I mean, he literally built 
everything. I was seven years old when he started building it. We lived in a tent on the property for six weeks while he was building. It was fabulous. Fa it was, it was, I could tell you so many. I loved it. I loved every minute of it. Um, so uh, he did all the field stone on the front. I could tell you stories about that as well. Um, he, uh, it's hard to get a, a good front picture of it because it's right on the water and if you go too far, you fall in. So um, I didn't want to do that. Um, yeah, the water's cold in November especially, right? Yeah, yeah, Carl knows. Um, so this is the back of the house. Um, he added this porch about 10, 15 years after he built the house. So this porch with the windows there, that wasn't there originally, but it's, it's, a gourd, it's one of the rooms we live in. <coughs> and that's the side. Um, this is the interior. I'll go through it quickly, but he did everything. He did the stonework on the fireplace. He did all the paneling. He made the clock on the mantle. He made the fire screen, the metal screen. He could do metal work. He made the fire screen. Um, he, uh, I love this old wood stove. I could tell you stories about that, but he did the field stone work for the wood stove. Um, the tile work on the floor, the terracotta tiles, which are pristine to this day, and they're probably 60 years old. Not loose, not broken, nothing. When he put something in, he put it in. It lasted. Um, I have funny stories about that, too. Um, he built this dry sink. Uh, he made pantries for, the, for food, that, uh, for storage. Um, he made the, uh, the beds, in, that's a double bed in, in my parents' room. He made the little jewelry case thing up here. Um, the picture on the right, there are two twin beds, and they have, uh, you can see the drawers underneath. You can see the handles. Those are drawers that pull out for storage. They weigh a ton. I can't move them. <laughs> so I don't have to clean behind them, so that's good. Um, this is, he built in the furniture for the... Um, uh, built in cabinets and drawers and everything for the rooms. He built a gun case. That's the one on the right. He made the barometer. Um, and these are some real old pictures. And I think in the interest of time, I'll just um, go through quickly. This is good, though. He actually did get deer, unlike what Bob Sacco accused him of. <laughs> and um, he did catch a fish from now, now and again. And that, that picture on the right is of him caning up at the lake, sitting by, down by the water at the dock doing caning projects. All right, I'm going to have to go through furniture real quickly, and unfortunately, because it's private furniture, but I wanted to show you at least the Gertie pieces because it just went on and on. The reason that I put this up, this is wood burls. Have you ever seen a tree that has a burl on it, a big, like, looks like a big uh, mass growing off the side of the trunk? That's a place where the tree has tried to heal itself from some sort of lightning strike, bug infestation, whatever, and so it makes this big lump on the side of the tree. Well, it looks ugly, but when you cut through it, it's beautiful, gorgeous wood, and it's not that common, so it was used a lot. Gertie used a lot of burl wood, it's called. Um, it, it was very expensive because not all trees have those, you know, growths on them. So um, I just wanted to show you what it looks like, what a burl wood starts out as, and then when you cross-section it, how gorgeous it is, and that's how you can see the Gertie pieces are so beautiful. So this is, the, this is in my house now, the dining room um, table and the chairs, but he made the, uh, that set for his parents, and it was in their house until that they passed away, and um, he gave it to me. But you can see he hand-carved all the chairs. He, there were probably eight of them. I, I have um, four of them. Um, this is, he had some in his house, and then the one on the right, he upholstered them as well, um, all hand-carved. But I wanted you to see what, what he learned at Gertie. This is the dining room table, but this is that burl wood inlaid around. And that all had to be done by hand. So you had to soak the wood so you could bend it. I mean, just very elaborate. Um, a lot of gluing, mahogany. You can see the grain in the wood, which is gorgeous, which is why he didn't want anybody to ever paint anything. This is the bottom of the table, hand carved, all made. And the little um, metal pieces at the end was a signature of Gertie. I found a table, uh, if you want to look it up online, that um, Gertie 
that, that they're auctioning that was a Gertie piece that looks identical to this table that he made. Maybe he made that one that, that they're auctioning. I don't know. It could have been someone else. I don't know. This is the credenza that goes with that dining room table that he made for his parents. He made the mirror too. And you can see he made the mirror like 40, 50 years later. I don't even know. And see how it matches the credenza. And it's not the same wood. Um, but he made that mirror for my dining room. Um, you can see some of the chairs he caned. Um, he didn't make those two side chairs, but he did the caning on them. Um, this is the credenza close-up. Again, I just love the detail in the wood. That's why I took the close-up pictures. Um, uh, the, this is the top of the credenza. Again, you can see the burl wood, the mahogany, um, and that's the doors. Um, this is kind of a messy picture. I, I apologize for that. But this is the hope chest he made while he was at Gertie's for my mother. And he, um, uh, it, I didn't have any other pictures of it except when the house was being cleaned out. So it's a, it's a mess in there. I, I apologize for that. But again, this was one of his favorite pieces. He loved this piece. Maybe, too, because he gave it to my mother. But the, the carving on the fan and the burl wood and just unbelievable. He made a record cabinet out of that burl wood that, you know, um, you can open up store records. It's got two drawers. He made this gorgeous drum table. Um, it, that was also at Gertie. You can see the inlay. Um, there was a little accident with that, and Carl was kind enough to what we, what we call daddy's glue, and he fixed it right up for me. I appreciate that. And these two chairs he did not make, but he refinished. They were a mess when they came in, old upholstery, you know, just a mess. Um, he refinished them, did the caning on the back, upholstered the seats, um, and there were still more that, that were waiting to be finished. Um, there were more in this set, beautiful, beautiful chairs. And you can see the inlay in the table um, made at Gertie. It has drawers in it, the same footing as the dining room table. He made this later on after he had left Gertie um, when he was married, this beautiful hutch. Um, it's the same hutch, it's just that the photography is different, but it's not any different wood or anything. Um, this dry sink was to match it. I'll go through this quickly. He made a secretary here that folds down. You can see the carved half fan in there. Um, this is old pictures of the upstairs that he did over the whole thing. He built in drawers, closets, bookcases, did the whole thing. The grandfather clocks, he made three of them. Um, again, you can see the Gertie influence on the top with the, with the um, uh, um, what do you call that? What am I trying to say? Anyway, you know what I mean. Um, <laughs> um, the raised door on the clock, he, and that's another gun cabinet he made. I love this clock. He made a bunch of these. There's probably a lot of people that have this clock in their house. Um, I love this. You can see the, the work he did with the, you know, the hand tools. I brought some hand tools, by the way, that you, um, if you'd like to look at at the, um, at the end, some old tools that I love them. I love historic old tools and the fact that they were his and he used them. Um, but you can see all the ornate work that went into that. He did all of that. Um, I'll go through these real quickly. This, this I do want to point out, though. This was his bedroom set, my, my parents' bedroom set that he made back in the early 60s, maple. Heavy, heavy, heavy. Could, could live through a tornado, I'm sure. A bed, two dressers, two end tables. This is in my uh, house now. Um, but again, the ornate work, the finial, that's what I was trying to think of. The finial in the middle there and all of that. These are my kitchen cabinets. He was a stickler for the finish. Talked about the sanding and how he would get on everybody's sand. You gotta, you, that's not sanded, what do you mean? You gotta do more, because it, it just would end up with this baby soft finish on the top. Um, just beautiful, um, and you can see how it gleams. So that's my key. He did my kitchen cabinets. He did a million caning projects. I know all of you or, or a lot of you have seen these. I, I'm not exaggerating when I say he must have done probably 50 to 100 chairs. I don't even know. I lost track. More? I, I lost. I mean, you couldn't even keep track. And upholstered and, and he did, I mean, and he loved the caning. He taught the caning in the class. And some of you guys um, still do it and love it. 
Yeah. Um, shelving, you know, the, the wheelbarrow he made. And then this novelty, I'll go through it, real but you guys know about his novelties. He gave out novelties every year at the holidays. Um, I had a few, uh, this isn't all of them either. Th I have two slides. These are some of the close ups. My, one of my favorites, I love the snowman and I love the mice. I think they're so cute. The legs move. He made all of these and he would give them out as presents at Christmas or if somebody did him a favor or whatever. Um, uh, and these aren't, this isn't all of it. I just ran out of time and space and, you know. Um, so he hand carved these. He made uh, these dogs. Um, and I used to tell him that he could say, he could put the name of the dog on there and then sell them. The one on the left was his Beagle Jack. The one on the right was my Norwegian Elk Hound Pepper. Um, these sleds he made. Um, I mean, I could just clearly I could go on and on this is one of my the reason I put this in this is one of my personal favorites it's a little thing but I love it it's a little shelf and it the the pot that holds it up uh, the support it looks like a bow so all the pieces were cut out like a bow and I just love it, it, it I think they're so sweet so um that's one of my favorites all right so quick through the personal life pictures and we'll do, we're done um there he is at his high school graduation with my mother um, at the beach, Revere Beach, that's where you went. You grew up in Revere, you went to the beach, you lived at the beach. Um, this I love, I just want to say a word about, I didn't even know this, but I was going through, you know, the papers and all the things um, when, after he passed, and I came across, this was a front page article on the old Boston Record American newspaper from uh, 1949, and um, it says, actually, let me, can you read it from there? I don't know if you can read it, but it just says, it says the name of the people, it says, you know, the sub person, and then Tom and Michelle are both of Revere, and it says, brave chilly winds um, early today as they wait for the first rush seats to the all-important Red Sox-Yankees game this afternoon at Fenway Park. And he made the front page sitting in line waiting for it. So even back then, um, but I just love that, so I wanted to throw that in. Um, this is his sister on the left, his mother, my parents, and that dog is gorgeous. I'm not sure if that's Bucky or not. He had a dog named Bucky. His military picture, his wedding, his parents are on the right, um, wedding portraits, gorgeous, weren't they? Uh, cutting the cake. This is not a good picture, but I just love the fact that it was his graduation from Fitchburg State, so I put it in. It's not a great picture of him. Obviously, it's blurry. And I had to put this dog in because this dog was like his sidekick. Do um, you remember Silky, Donna? Oh, you didn't? You probably... Did you? Um, he, uh, he was... Uh, he was like attached to my father. I could tell you really funny stories. So in tribute to my father, I put a picture of Silky. Um, that's me at a senior um, senior awards thing when I was graduating from high school. Some Christmas pictures. Oops. I love this picture because he loved <coughs> being the snowblower person on the street. He did everybody's drive. He couldn't do he he would do any driveway anywhere. He used to do like five of them. You know, he, he loved it, and he always had a Saugus hat on. That's his Saugus hat. So I'm, I love this picture because he just was Mr. Snowblower for sure. And in September, he'd start worrying about that. I got to get the snowblowers ready. Got to get the snowblowers ready. Dad, it's September 5th. I know, but you know. Um, some birthday pictures. And then I, I won't go through, um, but he was person of the year and he, so he had some awards and things like that. I just kind of put in. Uh, and that's it. And the last thing was one year for either his birthday or Father's Day. I can't remember. But I um, designed a business card for him that I had printed up because he, people were always coming to him and saying, you know, how do we get in touch with you? Or we want a catering job or my sister-in-law wants this done or whatever. And, um, you, know, he's, he, you know, they never had a piece of paper to write it down on or anything. So... Um, I made him some business cards, and um, I think this is probably from like the 70s. But it's so, you can tell it's old because the Saga still had a 617 area code on it. Um, but that is the whole thing. I appreciate your attention very much. Please feel free to come look at the books if you want. There's some books on construction and, and cabin construction and all. 
And I also have a box that I'll pull out um, of some of the old tools. And he used a lot of the old hand tools to do some of that fine work because to him it was, that's how you did it right. You did it with the hand tools. So he certainly used a lot of machinery, but a lot of those hand tools for some of the fine work. So, so thank you all so much for coming. I really appreciate it. It's so nice to see all his friends. Really nice. Thank you.